I bring you greetings in the matchless name of my Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the Honey Badger himself, Reverend Bob Lico, and I am presenting part two of a presentation dealing with the Lord's Supper, focusing in on particularly Paul's comment about eating and drinking damnation unto themselves. I really encourage you to listen to the first presentation because I don't have time to go back over a lot of material that I covered then. And honestly, both of these presentations are simply very simple and direct teachings. I'm not going to get into a lot of weeds and minutia. The church has unfortunately argued over this doctrine for well over a thousand years. And unfortunately, many in the church today are simply wrong. They do not understand what the Bible and our Lord Jesus plainly taught and said, and what Paul plainly taught and said. And it is the Lutheran Church in particular, the Missouri Synod, that I am focusing on, although this is, the statements I make are true for the cult of Rome, the mother of Lutherans, the Greek Russian Orthodox sects, S-E-C-T-S, <laughs> and uh, the Melkites, I think all pretty much hold the same point of view regarding who can receive. But let's look at this real quick. Eating and drinking damnation unto themselves. As we saw in the first presentation, when Paul spoke to the Corinthians about this, he was talking to a church that was completely messed up. And today, this text, this one phrase in Paul, is totally misunderstood by virtually all Lutherans and others who've fallen into the deception of so-called man-made sacramental practices and theology. Paul says people eat and drink damnation unto themselves when they failed to discern the body of Christ. And I declare to you openly that it is the Lutherans and others whom I just mentioned who fail to discern the body of Christ. They've ignored the context of this entire letter and have taken up a view that is unbiblical and made it the focus of Paul's pericope here concerning the Lord's Supper. The context of the entire letter to the Corinthians, as I've already demonstrated in the first teaching, was that of the need for unity. They were divided. There were many heretical, which meant simply meant parties, camps, if you will, cliques within the city church at Corinth. Some followed the teachings of Apollos, other Paul. Some said they were of Peter. Some said they were of Paul, others of Christ. And Paul goes on to say, look, guys, I, I, I baptized a couple people. I don't think I baptized. I don't know if I baptized. I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. But that's okay, because Christ did not send me to baptize, which is a real eye-opener to those sacramental theologians amongst us. Baptism was not the focus of Paul. Neither was the Lord's Supper. And frankly, my brothers and sisters, what we know about the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, if it were not for Paul's correction to the Corinthians, the Christian church today would have very little to go on. We have the comments in the Gospels, which are virtually all say the same things, same event, and that's it. Were it not for Paul's correction, nothing else is said about this doctrine by the other writers of the New Testament. Peter really doesn't deal with it. James doesn't really deal with it. 
John doesn't go into any detail about it. All right, moving on. The context of the letter to the Corinthians was their lack of unity, their disorder, their lack of love for one another. That's why Paul writes an entire chapter about love and the body. So the Corinthians' error or sin, the reason, if you will, that some were sick, weak, and had died was due to not discerning the visible church amongst them, their brothers and sisters. He talks about us being one loaf. Are we not all one loaf? And this lack of love offended and to this day offends the living God who is moving in their midst both sovereignly and in the lives of all of his baptized, born-again, blood-washed, blood-bought people. The Corinthians did not get weak, sick, and die because they failed to believe or discern that the bread and the wine is actually transformed into the literal body and blood of Jesus. Now, that's what the Lutherans would have you believe. And maybe the Roman Catholics, I'm not sure. But I know the Lutherans teach this, which is why they deny access to the altar, access to the bread and wine, in their mind, the body and blood of Jesus, to anyone who isn't a member of the Lutheran church, or whom the pastor has not sit down, uh, sat down and grilled previously. And virtually no one does that who's a visitor to a church. Um, sometimes the pastor may ask someone if he's up there shaking hands with the greeting folks. But the Lutherans teach that unless you have been catechized in the LCMS, in particular with the branch of the uh, sect that the Lord delivered my wife and I out of after a decade and being trained in their seminary system and working and preaching and teaching in their, their congregations for a decade, the Lord delivered us out of their errors. Thanks be to God. Uh, but they believe, teach, and confess that unless you are basically a, a member of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, with very few exceptions, you do not get to come forward. Now, what they teach about the body and blood is, is, as we've covered already, it is becoming the literal, actual, genuine flesh of Jesus. And that wine in the, the cups become, has become his actual, literal, physical blood. Uh, and so his grace is now offered in his physical body and his physical blood to those who are worthy. Uh, that understand, that have received the gnosis, that have been catechized, that have joined that sect or that congregation. Because after all, it's my job as the pastor, the Missourians think, to guard and be the gatekeeper to the altar for the protection of the ignorant believer who is failing to discern what's really happening here so they're going to get sick, weak, and die. Brothers and sisters, as I covered before, that's not what Paul, by the Holy Spirit, via the King of the Church, the Lord Jesus himself, said. In that whole pericope, he says, And let a man examine himself, and so let him eat and drink. The pastor is not the one who does the examining. The denomination, the Book of Concord, the deacons, the elders, the trustees, Mama Jones on the second row, is not the one who determines who is worthy to receive unmerited favor from God. Do you see the real confusion here amongst the Lutherans? Oh, it's a means of grace. But if you don't meet these conditions, you don't get the grace. Well, grace is unmerited. There are no conditions placed on grace. If it has any condition, 
it ceases to be gracious. This is Christianity 101, folks. And yet they say, no grace for you. You're not a Lutheran. You don't understand this. So it's going to be evil for you. But good for us. Well, I got news for you Lutherans. I've watched your lives for over a decade. And frankly, I've seen a lot of weak, sick, and dying people in the Missouri Synod. Your pews and churches are filled with them. And yet you properly discern and your denomination is dying. There's no vibrancy or life or joy even during the celebration of the Lord's Supper. No, you eat and drink damnation unto yourself, not discerning the visible church and denying, if indeed your teaching was even true, you're in very serious trouble, if you're right, because you've denied the very grace of God to the rest of your brothers and sisters. That is unloving, and it offends the living God, who is indeed in the midst of us, as we gather in the holy name of Jesus. So let's clear that up. And that's the title of, of course, this series. Well, how then is Jesus present? I encourage everyone to go to the CARM website, people I know and uh, support their organization, and read their article on uh, Roman Catholicism and transubstantiation versus the real presence and the real presence. As we've already covered, the Lutherans try to take a middle ground they try to say, well, we don't believe in transubstantiation. That's not true. And we don't support consubstantiation, even though we say Jesus is with and under, with meaning con, and under and around the elements. Actually, the, the Lutherans place, place him more in there, in a way, than, than even Rome. Uh, he's in with and under. He's the totality of the thing. Okay. If Jesus is, in fact, literally present, actually, physically there, then we ought to be able to discern his presence in the elements that he himself has transformed in some form or fashion materially. But we cannot. Jesus Christ is not physically present in the bread or the wine. First, he never literally said he would be. We've already looked at the, the use of metaphor and how Lutherans and others all of a sudden throw grammar out the window and every other example where the Lord refers to himself metaphorically and now all of a sudden, in violation to all Old Testament commands and precepts, he says something literal. No, he doesn't. Secondly, it is not necessary that he be physically present in the bread and wine in order, number one, to be amongst his people or to bless them. Answer this. How does his real presence differ from his presence promised when two or more are gathered in his name, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. He is the same Jesus after all. So how is it that when two or more gather in his holy name for prayer, that he is promised to be present amongst us? I am with you. I will never leave or forsake you. So how suddenly is his presence different when he invades and inhabits and possesses bread and wine? The Lutherans believe, teach, and confess that Jesus is genuinely present in the bread and wine. As I said, so much so that they state that Jesus is in, with, and under the consecrated elements. The bread is the genuine body of Jesus, and the wine is the genuine blood of Jesus. The faithful Lutheran, or any adherent to sacramentalism, believes they are consuming the literal flesh and blood of the Lamb of God. 
Please answer the following questions. Number one, please cite one example where the living God became united with any non-sentient object in the Bible. Physical bread is dead dough. But you say the physical bread becomes the literal body of Jesus. Right. Again, please show me one example where God inhabits an intangible object and it becomes God. The flesh and blood that they say they're handling is nothing less than Almighty God. Right. Show me another example. Let a doctrine be established by two or three witnesses. Give me a couple, two or three more witnesses. There aren't any. God never becomes an intent, does it take something intangible and transform it into himself? Never has happened. Doesn't do that. He doesn't operate that way. They say that Jesus is genuinely present in the elements. However, he cannot be. Tasted. The bread remains bread. It tastes like bread and not like any flesh. And it too is eventually excreted as is all food. The wine remains wine, red or white. It too does not look or taste like blood. Jesus cannot be seen. These elements appear and remain looking exactly like bread and wine. These consecrated elements, when examined with scientific devices, have been shown to remain as they were prior to prayer, to the prayer of consecration. That is, they remained bread and wine, that nothing physically or organically has changed in them according to scientific investigation. Well, their response to these questions, and these are not new questions, these are things that people brought up way back in the Dark Ages, in the Middle Ages, when Rome was teaching this, these lies. Well, you have the pious punt of the, of the Greeks and the Russians. It's a mystery. We don't know how it becomes the body and blood of Christ. Jesus said, this is my body. Now, we believe him to be literal here for some strange reason. We don't know how it happens. We don't believe in consubstantiation or, or we don't believe in transubstantiation like Rome. We, we, it's a pious punt. It's a mystery. Or as Lutherans and Catholics and many Christians, when challenged with things they can't explain, and yet they cling to tenaciously, they'll say, well, this is an article of faith. Well, this honey badger doesn't roll that way. What do you mean an article of faith? My faith is based on the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen? Amen. So don't tell me something's an article of faith, which means I simply am to believe this because, in quotes, the church has always believed this. With five minutes of research, you can find out real quick the monolithic church has agreed about very, very little. We agree about a half a dozen points of doctrine and maybe not even that many. It's really very sad. So I don't go in for this, oh, just believe it because we don't have any biblical proof for it. It's just something we believe just because. I mean, everybody believes this, Bob. I mean, yeah, you know. No, I don't believe that just because. I believe things that are founded on the word of God. You're telling me that this wafer, that this man just prayed over, has become the actual body of my God. Well, science says that it's still bread and wine. Well, you just said, well, my faith doesn't make it the body of Christ. Lutherans are very plain on this. It's the body of Christ, whether you believe it or not. 
It's the blood of Jesus, whether you believe it or not. My faith doesn't change it into the body of Christ for me. It is or it isn't. And I'm telling you, it isn't. They make a big deal and argue over the Calvinists and other Christians who, on the other hand, would say, yes, he's really there. The Lord is present with his people, but his presence is spiritual. And his real presence is spiritual. They deny that. Lutherans deny that. Since the bread and the wine after consecration remain bread and wine under all possible examinations, I ask, how can it be the actual physical flesh and blood of Jesus, the Christ of God? No physical change has occurred with the bread and wine after prayer, bell ringing, and the making of the sign of the cross over the elements. There's still bread and wine. Any divine activity associated with this meal must then be spiritual, non-tangible, physically, but genuine in occurrence in the spiritual realm. You see, Lutherans and many Christians have this idea that spirit is somehow unreal. Well, they're metaphysically ignorant. I'm sorry, many Christians are, just as a fact. Unless you study these things out and meditate and pray and seek the Lord about them, you're just not going to get it. We have, see, today things have gone so far. I mean, we'll say, the, uh, you'll hear it at funerals, you'll hear it with a group of friends. Hey, you, I'd say it, uh, a group of friends. You're going, you're going to the game tomorrow, John? It's Ohio State versus Michigan. No, I can't go, guys. I've, I've got something. I just can't. I can't make it. But I'll be with you in spirit. Or at a funeral. Just went to one a few weeks ago. You know, and it's, well, he's with us in spirit. Or she's with us in spirit. She's looking down from the pearly gate. She's looking down from the banister of heaven and is with us right now in spirit. Well, to, to the modern mind, that means the person's not really there. They're, they're somewhere else, but they're kind of thinking, thinking about the game while it's going on or rooting for our team, even though they're not present. Well, that's not what spiritual presence is biblically. A spirit being present with you is just as real as your mother or father sitting next to you in a pew. Look at Deuteronomy 23. I love this text. 23, verse 13 and 4. Very obscure text. Haven't heard much preaching on it. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be, when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back, and cover that which cometh from thee. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee, and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, and that he see no unclean thing in thee, and turn away from thee. Now, what do we see here? I find this amazing. I don't know how, how it is Bible teachers and preachers just glide over this and move on or, or never even deal with it. I'm sure this text is not in the one or the three-year lectionary, so it's never preached on from the pulpits of, of those churches in bondage to the man-made lectionary. But what this tells me and what I find very interesting was here we have the camp of Israel. They've left Egypt. They're, they're sojourning in the desert. And the Lord is so present with them and is actually walking, literally walking around the camp that Moses is commanded and said, hey, when you guys, you know, do your business, bury your crap, cover it up. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee. So they didn't see Yahweh walking around, but he was walking around. He was really present, but he was in a spiritual form. Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. 
Paul talking to the Corinthians says, hey, when you're gathered in the name of the Lord and, and his spirit's there and I am beholding you in the spirit, you know, turn such a one over to Satan. I don't think Paul, I think Paul was actually meant some, some way metaphysically, he was there observing what was going on. He had that ability, perhaps as an apostle. The point is this, real and spiritual are not oxymorons. Jesus can be really present with us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper without becoming the bread and wine. That's manifest throughout scripture. Let's look at some of the communion confusions. And you know, God is not the author of confusion. The enemy is, Satan is, our adversaries are. Where there is strife, there is every evil work. And the church has fought and argued and they've killed one another. We've killed one another over these very types of discussions and issues in the past. And I think this is simply a sign that God is not involved in this doctrine, the way that these Lutherans and others are preaching and teaching it. Because of all of the confusion and questions and animosity and division that has risen up over them for well over a thousand years. All right, let's begin. Controversy exists over whether infants and children can receive communion. In the Lutheran church, and the uh, Roman Catholics, I believe the Episcopalians, they deny those they have baptized as infants until a certain age. Whereas the Orthodox groups admit infants and children. What's the problem? Well, it's very evident. Lutherans believe that God grants eternal life through their ritual of infant baptism. That when they sprinkle water on the little infant's head, they're born again. They are given eternal life. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. They are a member of the body of Christ. But they deny them and and they teach, preach and confess, excuse me, that baptism is a means of grace, just as the Lord's Supper. Infants taken unwillingly to the font are baptized against their will, desire, and yet receive because, after all, it's not their works. Nothing they do, believe, or anything. It's grace. God just does this because he's so good and he is God. And I don't deny his goodness or his divinity. But then when it comes to the other means of grace, the altar, where God himself becomes bread and wine, the eternal God is right there in, in that man's hand and in that little shot glass, the eternal right there. They deny their baptized members access to this channel of grace. The Orthodox are at least consistent they have a false practice and doctrine of baptizing infants, but at least they're consistent enough to say, well, they've received grace here. They can receive grace at the altar. They're members of the church. We cannot deny members that we ourselves have baptized. We know they're members, but the Lutherans do all the time. And that's a controversy. Who's right? Are the Lutherans right to deny the infants the grace of God at the altar? until they reach a certain age, in other words, until they have a gnosis, until they've been instructed to receive grace. How does that even work? So there is controversy. Another controversy. Controversy exists over the use of red wine or white wine in various congregations and confessions. Which one did Jesus use? We really don't know. They had white wine, they had red wine, and they had rosé back in the day. Where do you think we, do you think we just invented rosé and white wine in the last couple hundred years, 1500 years? Not from the beginning. Which did Jesus use? Now, the controversy is this. Some use only red, 
because it looks like blood, blood is red, and so as the people take this, it reminds them, oh, I'm drinking blood now, even though it's, it's red wine. Others use white wine for exactly the opposite reason. We don't want you to get into some sort of mystical mindset. That's not what's, so, so they only use white. Who's right? And again, which did Jesus use? The Bible, completely silent on both of these. Number three, does the change occur before when the bells are rung? During or after prayer? The Roman Catholics, uh, they're all, they, uh, they ring the bells when the change is happening because the priest has turned his back to the people. He's mumbling over the elements, sometimes in Latin. It used to be at least Luther changed it to English. So is it when he rings the bells, when he says the words of institution, or when he makes the sign of the cross? When does the change actually take place? None of these people know. Then we have the whole kerfuffle over who can consecrate the bread and the wine. Is this only the pastor? Does it have to be the bishop? Could it be any believer who is upright before the Lord? Don't know. Who gets served first? Does the pastor serve himself? In some churches, the pastor serves himself. In other churches, a subdeacon or the deacon serves the pastor, who then serves the deacons, or the pastor first serves himself, then the deacon. It gets, again, who gets served first? And there are instructions about either it is the pastor or it is. It depends where you go. Controversy, oh, this is big in America. I don't know about other countries. Exists over the use of wine versus grape juice. And there's a great... Oh, the, the Reformed are always made fun of because they use grape juice. Well, first of all, not all Reformed just use grape juice. Uh, some do, some don't. But does it matter? Jesus said the fruit of the vine. Those are grapes. Well, wine is fermented grape juice. But grape juice is nascent wine. Does it matter? Well, it matters to them. It matters tremendously. Controversy exists. You see my little picture there. Over the use of individual cups or a common cup. What about uh, those wholesale pre-filled ones? It's got, you see, it's got the little uh, wafer on top and a little bit of grape juice uh, there. And you just pass those out in your mega churches, you know, down the aisle and you know, you could probably take it home if you wanted to. Well, there's controversy. Should we drink the individual cup? But Paul said, is it not the cup we bless? Jesus had one cup. And I agree that if you're um, into sacramentalism, that the one cup really doesn't break that union, where the individual cup somewhat kind of breaks the, the flow there. Everybody doing their own thing versus being one body and the reason for the individual cups of course is the fear of germs even though silver does kill germs well for the weak consciences of some will punt and do the uh, individual cups also even though the bible is very plain it is very clear on the new testament is clear about this it was a common cup so if you're going to follow the Bible and you're following over yourselves and you're tripping over grains of sand and making up uh, mountains out of molehills, then why don't you follow the Bible here as well, be consistent, and use only a common cup? Well, some of the people will see it's only one cup and won't come up. If they don't want to obey the Bible, that's their problem. Moving on, controversy exists over what type of bread to use. Whole wheat bread, white bread, maybe that's racist. It should be brown bread. 
Jesus is pretty brown. He wasn't white. Pumpernickel, how about that? A combination like Obama of white and black. What about gluten-free? That's a big issue in America. Oh, yes, now that we're all so nutritional and we all seem to have celiac disease and are, have gluten intolerance all of a sudden, that maybe some of the wafers should be gluten-free. What about the weakest amongst us, brother, brother, sister, that has this glu gluten illness? Maybe we should use Jewish matzah or some sort of a, a liquid wafer dough that is baked and, and hardened. Brothers and sisters, actual division and disunity and fights exist over this issue alone, the type of bread that is to become God. Well, then naturally controversy exists over what to do with the leftover bread and wine. Some congregations and denominations, the pastor will eat and drink it all. And they try to kind of, you know, count the amount of people and make sure that, you know, the guy doesn't want to be drinking a whole bunch of wine up there. Uh, but that's what they do. It's been consecrated. It's the body of Christ, so he gobbles it down and, and, and you know, uh, drinks it down with the wine. Other churches, the man that inter interviewed me for a vicarage in Tennessee, the man over the Tennessee district, his congregation, after they're done, they take it out and they burn it. And he gave me some sort of Old Testament reason to burn it. Maybe it should just be thrown away. We're done. It's stale. We're done. Just toss it down the drain, put it in the garbage disposal. Well, that wouldn't be right. We don't want to do that, Bob. I mean... Or do we reserve it? Well, at Zion Detroit congregation where Tracy and I were members, former members, and under them, I don't know if he's still there, Pastor Mark Braden, they reserve it. They put the blessed wine and elements, the elements in a casket, which was to the, um, if you're facing the altar, it was to a little place of repose. And when the, any pastor at Zion steps up to that uh, aspect of the uh sanctuary they immediately turn and bow to the little casket why well that's jesus he's literally there and then they bow to the altar and then you know get on with it that's a controversy this is another issue at the bottom does jesus vacate the blessed elements or do they remain part of his physical body and blood now eternally, forever? They don't know, my brothers and sisters, which is why, out of concern and piety and fear, people like Mark Braden and the Roman Catholics and others will have a little casket and they will put that body in their little bed place of repose for the Lord until they could come and consume him the next time. Because they don't know. Does, is this sacramental union that they've invented permanent or temporary? Is it done when the pastor dismisses the people? They really don't know the answer to these things. Oh, there's more. Here's a whole bunch more. Another controversy exists concerning the alcoholics in our midst. Many Lutheran churches do not offer grape juice along with the wine. Reformed churches often do. They oft offer people the choice. Well, we don't offer grape juice, Lutherans will tell you, because that's not, the wine in the Bible was definitely alcoholic, which is a true statement. But then they violate God's word by going and breaking God's word to use individual cups. They're hypocrites. If Jesus wishes to transform wine into his blood, he can do the same to grape juice. 
And you'll hear Lutherans say, I don't know, and I've, I've counseled people who are alcoholics, and I, I've never known anyone who got back into drinking alcohol from taking communion. This is a holy time, and God, well, that's good for you to say that, but you really don't know how hopeless some alcoholics are. And man, just one little sip of alcohol. And they may never tell you. You'll never know that they've backslidden back into it because they're ashamed of their addiction and their failure before God and their sin. So why not offer both? Well, I say, is it legitimate to offer both wine and grape juice at the altar? They really don't know. They'll say no, but they don't have any scripture for that. They just tell you, no, it's not. How about this? Controversy exists over the practice of intention. You see, Jesus, during the Last Supper, according to the, the text, dip the sop. That's what the Orthodox do. They dip their piece of bread or wafer into the wine and take it that way. Lutherans and Roman Catholics and Episcopalians are non-bread soppers. Again, they don't follow what Jesus actually did the common cup and the sopping. The Orthodox at least follow the form. They don't understand it. They admit they don't understand it. They're at the mystery. But at least they do the outward form better than the Lutherans. All right, so which is it? Do we eat the bread first and then take a sip of, a, of the wine it's brought by next? Or do you dip it? Which is correct? Which is God-pleasing? If one way is right, the other way is wrong. And if it's wrong, then it has to be sinful. All right, how about this? This is a new one due to COVID, really. It's a huge ongoing debate amongst all of these groups whether one can commune online. Some say yes, and others a strong no. The confessional Lutherans are amongst the strong no voices. The Anglicans, you can go online, go Google, and just ask about communing online, yes or no, and you're going to find a ton of articles. Some are saying, well, mystically thinking, prayer has no distance. Uh, the priest doesn't actually touch every piece of bread or put dip his finger in the wine. He speaks over it. Does that have to be 12 to 18 inches in front of him for the mystical union to take place, however that happens, or not? Can you be sitting at home with some bread and your Mogan David in front of you and at 10 o'clock a.m. on your screen, the pastor's there speaking the words over those, and that becomes for you the body and blood. Well, Lutherans would say no. In fact, I cause a whole bunch of offense when I put up a meme saying, you can and should commune at home. Oh, <gasps> you thought I had blasphemed. You need someone who has the office of the keys to confess your sins to and to forgive you and to feed you the body and blood of Christ. The Bible doesn't teach that. You can confess your sins to one another, as the Bible says. You can confess your sins directly, as the Reformation was about, to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, whoever lives to make intercession on our behalf. Let us come boldly, the Bible says, to the throne of grace, grace, grace and receive mercy and help in the time of need no i don't need a pastor to say special words to make the magic happen i need to be before the lord i need the lord to be present and he's promised to be present when two or more are gathered in his name so get some bread get some wine and rejoice in your lord but can you commune online does the magic happen over distance well, apparently God is in heaven and he comes from wherever heaven is and becomes bread and wine. That's a distance. I'm sure he could travel from my house to someone else watching on a, on a camera. But that's a, that is a controversy. 
Some people like to take, and used to, and still do, take the blessed bread home, or just a little piece of it, and put it on their altar, put it in a monstrance, and they pray to it, and talk to it, since that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There he is. If, look, guys, here's the problem. If that's Jesus at all, if it's any of the divine person, it's all of him. You cannot divide the infinite. If you have any of Jesus, you have all of him. It's a metaphysical, philosophical fact. You can't divide infinity. Controversy exists over, again, as I've mentioned, who can consecrate the elements. Again, they say it has to be the pastor if you're a Lutheran. But they also say that it's not the personal holiness of the pastor that uh, enables him to do this. It's the grace of God. Well, again, I believe that any sincere believer can do this, even as they can hear your sins and forgive you as a believer. But look at all of these controversies. There's 14 or 15 that I've mentioned here. In all of this, I'd say this. I marvel, and I hope you do too, if you'll think about this, at the spider web of false doctrines that have attached themselves to this core error of Jesus' physical presence in bread and wine. Here's another controversy. What happens when a wafer is dropped? <gasps> Oh, I've heard the audible gasps at the altar from the pastor and the people. If he dropped one of the uh, wafers, or if somehow some of the wine was spilled. Oh, they have books on what to do, to how to clean them, where you pour the consecrated wine if it's not reserved. You have the whole issue about, of course, uh, the elements that you prayed for last Sunday, are they still consecrated? Every pastor I know re-consecrates the elements that have already been consecrated. Why? Well, just so the people can see me doing it and they know that they have assurance now that these have been blessed. Well, whatever happened to faith being the evidence of things not seen? There's no faith involved in this. They're playing games. They're being pious. They're being hypocritical in many ways. Well, they've had writings and, and, and pamphlets and books about what to do when a wafer's dropped or wine is spilled on the carpet or on the wood or a mouse eats a piece. Uh, what do you do to the mouse? Uh, do you eat him? Uh, does he become your brother? What? Uh, I'm being uh, serious. These are questions that have been brought up way back a thousand years ago. I marvel at the thousands of tomes of books written on Eucharistic theology in quotes when it is just one component of many comprising the doctrine of the New Testament church. I marvel at all the emphasis on something that is mentioned very scantly in the New Testament. It's mentioned at the end of the Gospels. It's mentioned a little more by Paul correcting an error, and nobody else mentions it. And yet it has become the focus every week of hundreds of thousands of professing Christians And I marvel at that. Why do I marvel at that? Because I marvel because all of the emphasis on inanimate bread and wine while ignoring and denigrating the human beings whom God actually indwells. All of these books written about bread and wine being 
somehow turned into the actual, turned into God. Let's just put it that way. It's turned into God. And somehow sinful human beings can handle and, and take into themselves literal God, almighty, holy God, and remain the same kind of people. Well, that's what I saw for over a decade. I don't see any big change in their lives. I'm going there believing that, and I believe the change happens as a charismatic extremist before I became a Lutheran. And I have very meaningful encounters with the Lord every time I commune with him at his altar. He does what he's promised to do. But I marvel at all of the emphasis the Lutherans have placed on his being present in this bread and wine and keeping other Christians away from his presence in the bread and wine for some odd reason, because it's going to hurt them. Nonsense. But anyway, they ignore 1 Corinthians 3.16. They ignore 1 Corinthians 6.16, 2 Corinthians 6.16, Ezekiel 36.27, 2 Corinthians 1.14, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, the Gospel of John chapter 16 and verse 13. Why is there so little teaching on this reality? Why is there so little understanding of the reality of the fact that we, you and I, as believers, have become indwelt by God himself? We are the tabernacle of the living God. We don't become God, no more so than the bread and wine become God. But he is present in us. We are joined with him. That is a biblical fact. And they don't emphasize this. They don't teach on the reality that we are the temple of the living God. And because of that, what manner of life ought we to live? No, that's a whole different level. That, that, that's piety. That's mysticism, Bob. Oh, it's not mystical to hold up a little piece of wafer and say this has become the literal, actual, physical body of the eternal living God of heaven and earth, who's created and sustains all things by his word and power. That's not mystical. That's what Jesus said, this is my body. That's not what he meant. And I've proved that already. I conclude with this, my brothers and sisters, the 14 confusions that I have pre previously mentioned, and there are others, a lot more. Every one of them is answered when one properly understands what Jesus said in context. All of these issues I've brought up go bye-bye. They vanish like smoke in the wind when we simply understand what Jesus said in context which is this, this do in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is a memorial meal. Jesus does not become the bread and wine physically. He is with us spiritually. He is with us whenever we gather in his name. And when we gather and have bread and wine in his name, we do it remembering his sacrifice, remembering that we are now the body of Christ, as Paul tried to hammer again and again and again into the hard heads and hard hearts of the Corinthians. They didn't get it. They didn't see themselves. They didn't see their brothers and sisters as members of the divine church as members indwelt by God. And because of that, many of them were sick, weak, and had died because it offended God, their lack of love, their enmity, their strife with one another, and then gathered together in Jesus' holy name and proclaimed that they're one and they love Jesus while they hate their brother. Oh, God will strike you down for that, my friends. So let's get back to the word. It's bread and it's wine. It's done in Jesus' name. We do it to remember his sacrifice. We do it as a form of proclaiming his death to the principalities and powers. Because if they'd known who he was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 
And so we proclaim that every time we gather and uphold that bread and that wine. We remember what Jesus has done and who we are in the Messiah. Selah.